Science has a very important role in the development and in the execution of renewable energy. We need to understand where to put our wind turbines, where to put our solar panels. We need to develop the technologies to extract energy in a more efficient and renewable manner. We also need to look at the impacts of our renewable energy efforts, making sure we're doing as little harm as possible. Science can make renewable energy more efficient, more effective, and a better partnership for our planet. An interesting thing about renewable energy is that weather drives it. So if you think of a wind turbine, it's at 80 meters or 240 feet up off the ground. And uh, the wind is higher there, but just like near the ground, sometimes it stops and sometimes it uh, all at once speeds up. So we really need to know when it's gonna be there. And we actually have to have kind of this big geographic area. The way I like to uh, explain it is, if you look at the weather map, you see these big highs. It might be a big high pressure system over western United States and a really strong uh, low pressure system with lots of weather in eastern United States. That's actually the scale that determines wind and solar energy. So what our study essentially showed was if you can capture a big enough area so that it's always blowing in part of it, then you can set up your renewable energy system to take advantage of that. If you include both wind and solar and you include a big geographic domain, the wind is blowing or the sun is shining or some combination thereof uh, is providing most of the energy we need. In fact, we found that 85% of the energy would come from wind and solar, and the other 15% is what's called dispatchable. We would actually use natural gas power plants, just like we do right now when we don't have enough, to fill in. So 85% wind and solar, 15% natural gas, which really reduces our CO2 or carbon dioxide release compared to what we do now. I do think that there are um, opportunities uh, for renewable energies uh, coming from marine resources, whether it's offshore wind, which has um, perhaps the largest potential uh, in the United States and in many other countries off their coastal waters. Um, there's a other hydrokinetic conversion, if you will, that basically convert energy that is in our waves and our tides and our currents um, to renewable energies. Uh, the potential perhaps isn't as uh, large in a global sense, but in certain locales um, it may be uh, a viable alternative for an energy source. So when you're looking at renewable energy extraction from the ocean on a commercial scale, you're looking at um, putting in infrastructure that is noisy, um, that it can impart acoustic noise. We have a lot of biological life in the ocean that um, is very sensitive to acoustic signals. Additional uh, impacts that one might be want to be aware of include the um, electromagnetic field radiation in the ocean associated with power cables that be lying on the seabed and how they would impact uh, the biological life there. Uh, there would be concerns about um, how you might be changing the physical currents locally um, in a particular region where uh, this marine renewable energy extraction is, is being done. Um, and uh, a fourth area concerned would be just preserving and sustaining ecosystem health or habitat health. Um, so all of those um, certainly are things that one has to consider if one is looking at building um, a commercial uh, renewable energy um, plant, if you will, or farm uh, based on marine resources. Uh, so one of the exciting things about, about the field is that there's been some, some very significant advances in the last 10 years in, in renewable energy, both in solar and wind and biofuels and a number of other technologies. But uh, specifically things that we're, that we're excited about is the fact that an industry has gone from a fairly embryonic state. Uh, I think there was literally less than uh, $20 billion worth of worldwide investment in renewable energy in the year 2000. And by the year 2010, there was over $200 billion uh, worth of investment in infrastructure and business creation. So um, there is actually double digit annual uh, average compound growth rates uh, in many of the technologies. So that tells you something's going on. 
terms of breakthroughs, um, I think most of what, we, what we're seeing now is moving down a particular cost curve. So there's been some significant advances in technologies that we know quite a bit about. Photovoltaics, uh, you know, it's been around for 100 years. But more recently, what we're seeing is a way to manufacture it in a very low cost way. My picture of the future is a, uh, an energy future where you have quite, not one solution, but many solutions. When you have wind, you use wind. When you have uh, plenty of sunshine, you use solar. When you have uh, excess biomass, like in, say, uh, Canada or, or Sweden, Finland, you use biomass. So uh, you have to use the resources where you find them. And I think in the future, what you will see is that we have one large system where you have an intelligent consumption, but also a large number of, uh, of sources of energy, all combined in a intelligent power systems. So I think an important part of that would come from wind, but not the only. There's no single solution to, to our energy future. I think that we're going to go through a transition to a different energy system. We have to. So we're going to be driven to deal with this issue whether we want to or not. And the wind and solar, which are basically carbon free and quite cost effective because of the uh, advancements we've made, they're going to be a big part of these new energy systems. And finally, a key thing that we can't keep putting carbon dioxide in the air the way we have. And the wind and solar energy systems solve that problem. So we're going to go through a big energy transformation. It's happened before. It'll absolutely happen again. And these systems are going to be a big part of it.